everyone, this is Aaron from Solar Network, and today I am speaking with Professor Dr. Daniel Lee. Um, Dr. Daniel, can you please uh, introduce yourself? And we're going to specifically talk about doing Asian American theology. There it is right there. Uh, yeah, yeah, can you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your book? Yeah, so uh, I serve as the academic dean for the Center for Asian American Theology and Ministry at Fuller Seminary. I'm also assistant professor of theology and Asian American studies. And uh, so the Asian American Center at Fuller, I helped found it. Like, so it's been a long journey of just being a Fuller and establishing the center, which I think is one of the most significant centers in terms of a, a, at a seminary, like an Asian American Center at a seminary. So that's basically what I do. Yeah. Um, did the book come out of your time at the seminary? Yeah. So my book, I mean, so I, I feel like I've been researching this book for the last, like, I don't know, 25 years or something like that it's been a long journey right so and i mm -hmm. in the book i talk about it it's been a long journey to myself because as asian americans it's very difficult to kind of articulate what it mean what does what does it mean to be asian american and i in the book i talk about how i kind of i was like stumbling in the dark trying to figure out what is going on what are these things <laughs> you know is it race is it culture is it confusion whatever it is right all these different things immigration or whatever and so I, I ended up developing this book, uh, this, this class at Fuller. Uh, it's called yeah, TM528, Asian American Theology, Identity and Ministry, Identity and Ministry. And I've, I've taught this class for like, you know, like almost 10 years, almost a decade. And uh, that's the book comes out of that, right? Okay. Yeah. Helping Asian Americans to understand themselves so we can actually bring all of ourselves to Christ, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. actually what, what, what the idea is. No, I love that. Um, I think it was at the beginning of the book where you talked about uh, Jesus was a Jew. And sometimes this this gets lost um, in, in sermons or just, you know, whatever, when we're talking about Christ. Now, um, that does have applications to Asian Americans. Can you work on that for us? Yeah. I mean, Jesus was not was not only was a Jew, but he's a Jew now, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And you did make, you made a point of that in your book. Yeah. Yes, you did, yeah. Right now, right now, for all eternity, Jesus is a Jewish man, right? <laughs> Palestinian Jew. So I think that gets lost. And and what's interesting is that, that that aspect of it is not lost on God, nor is it incidental in the Bible, right? That we have genealogies to make sure that Jesus represents, you know, Israel, right? The people, people of God, the chosen nation. So that is not something that's actually like something on the side. It's not marginal. It's it's actually front and center. It's so important. And what's interesting is that people talk about, you know, uh, their their uh, spiritual identity. Of course, our Christian identity is more important than everything else. I mean, in one sense, that makes sense. But the thing is, you don't actually you can't you can't separate your spiritual identity with who you are, right? I think people think, well, I am, you know, my spiritual identity is more important than other things, and I'm like, that's not how the Bible talks about it. Because Jesus, as a human, because well, I talk about this that the the Chalcedonian Creed when he talks about Jesus being fully human and fully divine, which I mean, I, I agree with it, but those are not those are Greek philosophical categories about this humanity. Bible doesn't talk that way because there's no there's no there's no such thing in the Bible or biblically uh, as a, as an abstract humanity. Mm -hmm. Like, have you ever met an abstract human being that's mm -hmm. just human without particulars? No, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We're always always human in our particular forms. So, for us to be in Christ, for us to be Christian, we cannot be in Christ uh without these things like i i always talk about the fact that uh i critique how a lot of times we say hey we're in christ no matter who you are right no matter who you are god loves us and i say it's actually not true it's as who you are god loves us as who you are you are in christ mm -hmm. when you look at uh like our particular identities all matter to god and we and or the flip side way of talking about it is that you want all these things to be in Christ because Christ uh, is Lord over all of these identities, all aspects of who we are, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't want these things to have a life of it, a life of their own apart from God, which basically means we need all of this in Christ. And of course, that's basically what happens in, in Scripture. Like when Paul is in Christ, Paul says, "Oh, I am this. I am that. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Benjaminite. I'm, you know, a Hebrew Jewish. I'm a Pharisee." But all of that is in Christ. And, and God is going to transform, use, and all that for God's kingdom. It's not like these things are like, uh, uh, will, will just be wasted in a sense. I think we talk about it as though 
we're going to be Christian, like separated from these things. And I think that's more of a kind of a narcissism, like leftover uh, ideas that it really isn't really biblically rooted. Yeah. Um, so I, I really enjoyed your book because it made me think hard about, yeah, what does it really mean that I am Asian American? And you you got technical in the book, and and we talked about this earlier, where your book is a little bit technical, but then it does get get to some practical aspects too. Um, the technical part was this part called the Asian American quadrilateral, or at least that's what I saw as, as being technical. I, yeah. I want to ask you what motivated you to make that. What was the process? And of course, you can explain it a little bit because that that really that was really the framework, right? Where you're saying, yeah. well, how how do can we define Asian Americanness? Obviously, there's so much that goes into it. But if you had to right. narrow it, right? If you had to distill it, what what is that? I mean, <laughs> so Asian Americans have the serious problem. Asian American communities <laughs> overall, uh, and the problem is. And it's not our fault, right? It's because there's such an erasure of Asian American history and Asian American studies in society mm. that it's very difficult for us to know ourselves. Mm, mm, mm. So even in my class, uh, you know, Asian American identity ministry, I, I I tell them, I tell my Asian American students, you know, most of you know more about Black history than Asian American history. Mm, mm, That's mm, because mm. we live in the society, right? Mm, and we, mm, because Asian American history is pretty much erased. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think, oh, Asian American history started when I when my family came to the U.S. I'm right, like, right, right. Oh, no, it didn't. <laughs> that is not true. We have 170 years of Asian American history. Yeah. I'm like, well, well, most of us came recently. I'm like, yeah, but why did most of us come recently? Mm-hmm. Because U.S. kept us out mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. actively, right? Mm-hmm. The first, mm-hmm. uh, first immigration law mm-hmm. was an anti-Asian immigration law. Racist mm-hmm. law. So mm-hmm. when you say, what does it mean to think that U.S. has a muscle memory to kind of exclude us as part being part of Asian, uh, be, being part of American? I think it's part of it. Now, so that's part of the issue. It's very difficult for us to know ourselves beyond our personal history. Right. But the particular <laughs> incident that basically helped me to figure this out, the, the Asian American quadrilateral, was uh, you know I was taking a seven day class and one of the professors was like, what is unique about Asian American identity and context? There's nothing unique. And I was like, wait a minute, that's nonsense. He's like, and I said, no, like there's there is a particular place that we live that's unique. And uh, what I realized is that uh, these things, all these four things in of themselves, is not unique. When you start overlapping them, we live at the intersection of these things, right? Mm-hmm. So all of it, and actually, I, to some degree, as you know, like Asian American category is really, really broad. And people are like, hey, it's so broad, it's useless. I'm like, oh no, it has its purpose. Mm-hmm. Now it's not everything, right? Like I consider myself Korean American and Asian American, right? Right, 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 like, right. They're 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 black people who are like I'm Jamaican, but I'm black as well. Sure, right? So sure. there's multiple things. Sure. I'm white, but I'm also German heritage. There's right. multiple things. So those things right. actually matter. When we talk about Asian heritage, all Asian her- Asian Americans have some kind of an Asian heritage, but so do people in Asia, right? <laughs> the question is, well, but we immigrated, we we ma- migrated over somehow. Some of us came seeking the American dream. Some people came as you know graduate students. Some ca- people came as refugees. Mm-hmm, but we mm-hmm. came somehow, mm-hmm. and those two things again already starts becoming kind of specific. And then you say American culture because we're all kind of part of American culture, and American culture kind of represents us in a particular way, and we. We internalize our representation, mm-hmm. which can be good and bad. I mean, ba- good more recently, bad all the years before. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the last sure. thing is racialization. The fact that, you know, I mean, like, it doesn't matter if, like, you know, if you're Korean, Japanese, like, you know, Filipino, you look East Asian enough and something happens in China, it all impacts us. Yeah. Now, we, we need a way of describing that. Is that everything? No, of course not. But that is part of our reality. So these four things, Asian heritage, Mm -hmm. migration experience, American culture, Mm -hmm. and racialization, all these things kind of uh, uh, help us, give us language to articulate what our experience is so that we don't, we don't, uh, you know, describe ourselves too stereotypically and crudely because that's not going to be helpful. Right, right, right. Um, I so the one that stood out to me the most was cultural representation. And maybe that tells more about me than it does about the quadrilateral because that one stood out to me. But um, yeah. I, I want to ask you, though, can you talk about your theology of cultural representation? Because in your book, you you sort of have like a, a section there that's specifically about that, which I think could actually be another book if you wanted to write about it. You know, I, I really enjoyed reading about that. 
how can we properly think through how non-Christians navigate that versus how Christians do, right? Because there there should be a difference, right? Yeah, always, always a difference, right? I mean, okay. uh, as, as Christians, obviously, we use all these tools, whether it be critical race theory or what, whatever, right? We mm-hmm. use all these different tools, but we always we always evaluate them because these tools are not perfect. I mean, like science, like biology, as you know, evolutionary biology. We use these tools, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, I mean, because they all have the logic of their own. We want to be careful, right? So mm-hmm. in that sense, uh, as Christians, we say, well, look, what is the point of, of a cultural representation? I, and I think the basis of it, of course, is the fact that we understand everybody, all of us, being made in the image of God. Yes. And, and of course, that also follows, you know, guides us to think about our vocation this way. In what ways do we produce and consume media and culture mm-hmm. that helps humanize who people are in, in three-dimensional, you know, in three-dimensional ways and not stereotypically reduce them? Right. right. So if we are consuming media or producing media that basically reduces people down to some kind of a stereotype, mm-hmm. it's dehumanizing them in a sense. Right. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we don't want to do that. And that's basically, part, I think, the, the foundations of how we think about cultural representation. It's uh, when you have like when you have very few representation, um, like, I think no, one negative way of thinking about it is like, hey, we want to see ourselves. I'm like, okay, that's, that's great because th- that, that is important. Mm-hmm. But I think that idea is the fact that we want to be in a place where we are able to really honor the image of God in all the people around. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when culture only represents certain people, people groups in a very reductive way, yeah. you realize, oh man, these people are being being dehumanized. Or maybe even for Asian Americans, we're yeah. being dehumanized. And yeah. we're not yeah, being yeah. able to really be be fully human and represent it that way. And that yeah. becomes really, really problematic. So that's basically why I think this is, an, this is a theological issue and, and, a, yeah. and a ministerial issue, a discipleship issue for our Christians as well. Yeah. No, I, I actually really appreciate that angle because it it is important, right, to, to, to see yourself and to be represented. But for the Christian, it's not about you, right? It's about the image of God. And that that yeah. really is, is, is worship to me, you know, and I, yeah. I really love that. Um, Let's talk about multi-ethnic churches. Okay, so um, what is it? How do you, how, how? okay, so I guess you can preface this, right? Or preface this. We, we were talking about this earlier, right? Tell me about what you've seen, what you've heard, especially with your position at your school, right? Because the arguments for, the arguments against, and how do you speak to these things? Okay. <laughs> okay. I have a friend. In Jersey, and uh, I, I I talked to him like a couple weeks ago, like you know, and talking about the fit along with him and other people. Uh, it basically that that's it was an impetus for me to write this chapter because I, when we talk about Asian American theology, so the okay, so the book is really helping people to have the right tools and and concepts to do the work, right? right, so right, right, right. I don't do all the work in a sense because it's a different book, yeah. but I, I end the book with two chapters: one on integration. What does it mean for discipleship? Like, why does this matter? Right. And so, and then uh, the last chapter is about look, um, look, do we need Asian American churches? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, is, is are, are multi ethnic churches the ideal? Like, yeah. is it a picture of heaven? If that's a picture of heaven, then everything fails. Mm-hmm. And one, and, and my friend said, you know what? I feel like you know one of the college students came up to him and said, hey, are we doing something wrong? Because mm-hmm. it seems to me that our churches aren't diverse and the picture of heaven is supposed to be diverse. So maybe we shouldn't exist, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's a crazy idea. There's so <laughs> many problems with that, right? And actually, I will tell you right now, a lot of the multi-ethnic church like ecclesiology books are not written by like real theologians. There's like mm-hmm. the practitioner, which I mean, I respect. Yeah. But I think even the idea of like, uh, what, there's a book called uh, United by Faith that just defines multi-ethnic churches as, as 80-20, right? And whatever right, has sure, more. Right. Now, what's crazy is the fact that the book talks about it as though the 80-20 doesn't matter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I, so you don't think it matters the fact that what the 80% is? <laughs> like, like you know, I, you think about what kind of nation we live in, like with the, with the, with the white dominance in a sense. I mean, if you think about it, like 80% black as opposed to 80% Asian as opposed to 80% Obviously, this has profound differences in the, right, how, the right, church, right. how the church would navigate, right? right so right, right. Uh, I think we it, authentic churches have very high ideals, but they can't live up to it. I mm. think that there's a there's a place for it. But the reason why I critique it is because I want the multi-ethnic churches to kind of calm down from its high horse and realize, mm. okay, you have your own set of problems. 
Asian American churches have their own set of problems, but we also have different kind of missions in a sense, mm, right? Mm, mm, mm. Um, it's not just the fact that it's not just the problem of you know homogeneous unit principle, like mm. because why? Because given the long history of white supremacy, all white church is something very different than an all black church historically yeah, yeah. speaking. Right, 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 like, right, right, it's right. not like they they both have some same kind of problems, right. and even for Asian Americans, right. some degree. So yeah, I think that's part of the issue. I mean, I, if I can describe one of the biggest problems of multi ethnic churches is the fact that, uh, and you know, um. Uh, um, Corey Edwards, she's written a great book talking about the fact that, hey, even if multi-ethnic churches are led by people of color, mm -hmm. because to get white people in the church, you have to kind of make them happy in a sense, because right, they have a right. lot more choices. Right. Therefore, you end up catering to them in a sense, right? Yeah, there's always up... the catering aspect, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. really, really important. So mm -hmm. for Asian American churches, I feel like <laughs> what I always say is like, we're always saying so sorry. So sorry we're here. And I'm like, why are you apologizing? Because so much of the Asian American church issue is affected. A lot of the people out there don't want to accept Asian Americans as their spiritual authority. Sure. Well, sure is that sure. our problem? Is that our sure. problem? The fact that people have racist, you know, bias, racial bias in a sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think that that should be something we, we should apologize about. That doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. The only way we can solve that problem is if we don't. If, if, if we don't exist as churches. Right, right, but right, right. how would we fix other people's racism by us not existing? That doesn't right, make any right, sense. Like right. I, it's, it's really identify what the problem is and, and target that instead of apologizing mm. for other people's racism, which mm. once again, that doesn't make any sense, right? Mm, 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 mm. We should address what the issue is and saying that that's racism. Right? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, my church is very blatantly um, ethnic. So... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, but but you know it it did take me a while to to come to understand what you were uh what you were speaking of not not from reading your book but just in my own in my own talking you know because this is not this perspective is not the norm right it's no. not the norm yeah and i think so much of the multi ethnic church books have been written by black and people and white people i'm like look we have a different perspective on this right 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 and right, i'm right. like well you can have your perspective but i mean as a theologian like mm -hmm. there's the reasons why i say this right and i say it just so there so what I talk about is the fact that there is a way in which all the churches functions and there's is, there's a reason why we all exist. Mm -hmm. Now we do have to p keep certain things in perspective and we have to kind of own where we are. Sure. But okay. I, I think you know, and also we have to understand the fact that we have our own weaknesses, where we have not we have, but we have our own strengths as well. Right, like right, what right. can we do that other churches can't? Because mm -hmm. that's definitely true, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, like 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 think about LA, all the Asian Americans here, who's gonna reach them? You right, think like right, predominantly right, right. white churches will reach them? No, that's not true. Yeah, they only yeah. reach certain kind of Asian Americans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the question is, who's going to reach all these different people, and mm -hmm. what does it look like? Mm -hmm. I think people don't really think about the the broader ecosystem of how we reach out, uh, what the worship looks like, right? Yeah, yeah. And that often, what, how we think about multi ethnic churches is really driven by like liberal multiculturalism that talks about like cosmetic, right, diversity, which really is in the, ends up being kind of being, being kind of toxic right it's it's just more more for decoration in a sense yeah. it doesn't really get to the real issues mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i i want to bring it back to to our own selves now because we've been talking about the church as a whole right we're talking about kind of big picture type of church as an institution type of thing i want to bring it back to ourselves personally your book talks about integrating uh the fragmented self in our Asian American churches, mm, uh, I want to know if you can if you can elaborate on that or, or give some practical steps to that, right? Because because yeah. we, we were talking about how how our identity should have a place or, or does shape our worship and our, our services, right? So how can we how can we integrate more of that uh, uh, cohesively into yeah. into our worship? Yeah. So I think my caveat is is when I say this, like. I actually don't think that the goal of of Asian, you know, Asian American theology or ministry or even what I do, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily to make people more Asian. Like I don't, okay, I don't even right. know what that means. Does that mean right. like, I'm gonna eat more kimchi <laughs> every day? Like, I, does that mean well, I'm gonna speak more Korean every day? I'm, you know, yeah. make sure that I, that doesn't mean that. I think that actually is kind of a Orientalist. <laughs> Orientalism or essentialism that kind of yeah. reduces it, puts us in boxes. That's not what we mean. Yeah. Right, 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 right. I think that the, the overall framework is not so much, you know, embrace your authentic self, which is actually more of a progressive agenda. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, no, mm -hmm. what are we, mm -hmm. we trying to talk about? Mm -hmm. We want Christ 
to bring God, you know, God's shalom to all aspects of who we are. Mm, mm, That's what the code is. So in yeah. one sense, we want all aspects of who we are to be in Christ. Right, we right, want right. all aspects of who we are to be integrated with each other. Right. The reason I say that is because when you grow up in the U.S. and, you know, maybe if you grow up in like, you know, SoCal, it doesn't really bother you much because you might live in like a majority Asian American. Yeah, yeah like, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Whatever, right. <laughs> right, but right, right. <laughs> if you grew up in certain parts of the country and you realize there are parts of who you are that you're like, I don't, I don't want this. Mm. I don't. And I, I describe it as like you, you kind of grew up and be like, and you have bad experience when you're like seven, you're like, mm -hmm. you know, you tell your seven year old self, like, Stay in the closet, stay in the kitchen. I don't ever want you to come out because mm -hmm, this is, mm -hmm. you embarrass me, right? Mm -hmm, right, right, right. And I feel like what ends up happening is there are different aspects of who we are where we try to abandon, right? Because we don't, we don't know what to do with this. It causes us harm, pain. It makes us mm -hmm. vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is Christ comes and says, hey, look, that self, that self will be healed in me as well. I am going to search for all this lost selves because mm. these selves have to be reconciled and healed and transformed mm. and they will all be used for God, for, for my kingdom. And I'm like, mm. you know, that's what we're talking about. That's what discipleship is, right? right, right so right. now I don't know what the journey looks like for every single person. Sure. And even when we even when we reconcile, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, once again, all of us will, what, make, eat more kimchi. Well, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> Yeah. It doesn't mean some stereotypical yeah. thing. Yeah. Because yeah. all of us have our own journeys, but it will bring more peace and God's shalom, healing to this thing so that mm. we don't feel like we're in conflict with ourselves. Right? Okay. 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 I think one of the biggest issues with Asian American churches is that, is that a lot of Asian American churches are culturally and socially Asian American. Okay. But I think we fail to do so theologically. Okay, right, right, right. Now think mm -hmm. about that. Like, feel like, right. what does it really mean? And I, I don't mean like we label our church as Asian American. I don't mean that. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, it, you don't have to necessarily have to do it this way. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, like we talk about being Asian American on service or not. Mm -hmm. we, we just have to, like, you know, when you, like, for example, when I preach and I do, like, you know, Greek exegesis, I don't always point out every single, you know, group, you know, Greek, Greek tense. You don't necessarily sure. have to. Right. It informs how I do ministry. So I'm very aware of that. Right. When you do, when you are aware of Asian American issues, you know those issues are there. So you you're very conscious about how you talk about obedience, for example. Okay. When okay, you talk okay. about God's fatherhood, I'm like, oh, be careful. That can't be talked about lightly. You have to see, unpack that thing. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah, you yeah. talk about the, like I said, obeying God or or being faithful, those things are, are, are fraught because we can easily make it into a, like another way of performing and make sure that yeah. we're being an upright citizen, modern minority yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So those things are what you do. It's not necessarily how much we label ourselves to be Asian American or not. Right. So I'm saying in ministry, it doesn't always have to be explicit. It can be implicit sure. as well. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like and when you like worship, saying, right? Yeah. It sounds like you're saying also just a general awareness of- yeah. Of of, yeah. of your culture, right? I mean, not necessarily yeah. like pinpointing every single thing, right? Just right. As as a whole, what 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 can we bring and what? How yeah, let me give you one example. Like I say, hey, look, we need a lot more robust theology of how we think about family. Okay. okay. Now you know okay, Western okay. Western the Protestant theology doesn't really even even include family. Sure, 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 sure. And we know that this because of individual parents, yeah. Mm -hmm. parents, extended children, they really matters a lot. It's mm -hmm. more than just, I mean, you know, focused family might do good things, but it's more, it's broader than that. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's thinking about these issues, right? It's mm -hmm. not even thinking about God as a parent, but it's also, also thinking about what does it really mean? And, and often the, the biggest conflict in Asian American churches end up not being church and state, for church and family. Yeah. Church and church. Church that? inside the church. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who in, talks about that, right? Interpersonal conflict. Yeah. Right. So nobody talks yeah. about that because there's a long history of people talking about church and state, you know, along I mean, from Augustine, right? But there's right, no, right, right, right. there's no like, theological tradition talking about church and family. Now sure. in, in the, in the Roman Catholic tradition, there's a longer tradition talking about family. Okay. okay. But for Asian Americans, we need this. And if we uh, yeah. if we yeah. address yeah. these issues, then I think it'll it'll easily serve our neighbors as well. Oh, Hispanic neighbors, they need that too. Right, they need right, to right. figure that as well. So mm -hmm. when we embrace and struggle with our own issues and theolo the theologically address and engage them, we right. will be able to kind of offer our gifts and serve right. the neighborhood better as well. Right, right, right. I we're, we're running out of time, but I want to I want to put you on record 
because you 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 wave the reformed flag, but oh, then you you also and you're very you're very but you're aware that sometimes the ideas sound progressive, right? Because you you've mentioned that to me before. You yeah, you're yeah. like yeah yeah you you might think this is liberal, but it's not. We're progressive. Can you just set the record straight on it as we end this podcast? About- yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I think it's great. <laughs> yeah, and obviously, in one sense, I am progressive a lot of things, but I think I distinguish between progressive and having a progressive uh, as kind of ideology. Any kind of ideology okay. is dangerous. Okay. Conservative okay. ideology or, or progressive ideology or liberal ideology. I think. I think the question is. I, I think fundamentally, I consider myself a reformed theologian because mm-hmm. I mean, this is actually how I understood. I think contextual, contextual art and everything else, and I talk about it in my book. Mm-hmm. You know, I I didn't like that stuff. I was like, do I really need contextual anything? <laughs> right, right, right. Like I should just all be reading Luther and, you know, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Calvin. I mean, I'm perfectly happy with that, you know, reading Bavik or whatever, you know, yeah. <laughs> which I, I appreciate. It's just that what I realize is that these people are taking their context very seriously. Mm-hmm. And it's part of, you know, in the reform tradition, there's, there's a whole tradition of Kind of confessing, writing confessions for a particular context, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there's a whole the reason why confessing Christ in certain contexts matters is because they're trying to articulate what the gospel looks like and how do you clarify what the issues are. I think contextual contextualization or contextuality gets a bad name because people think we're watering down the gospel, and I say, oh no, it's the flip side as well. We're clarifying what the gospel is. We're actually clarifying what sin is even more specifically. Mm. It's trying to make sure that there's something that, that gets, uh, you know, people, you get pieted on as, as, a, as, a, as a good virtue. Mm. If you can say, oh, contextually, this is actually how we sin, mm. how we miss the gospel, right? Mm. So mm-hmm. in that sense, for me, this idea of internal critique and having that kind of theology of the cross and uh, Lutheran terms, I think, has been, I think, a core of how I think about theology. So in that sense, I really think that what I'm doing is I'm really emulating all my reform reform uh, theology tradition, you know, like, uh, you know, mentors in a sense, whether it be mm-hmm. Carbot or or Bavink or whether it be, uh, you know, Calvin or Luther or Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Man. I think all of them were trying to think about what does it really mean to take the gospel seriously and really make that uh, sharp edge of the gospel, critical edge of the gospel come uh, and, and be manifested in a particular context. In that sense, I mean, because you don't you don't uh, follow reform theology or theologians by copying them. They, you know, in theology they call about they call it the you know re uh, re uh, 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 pristination. You're just copying them, like trying to be, okay, have okay. a pristine theology. But okay. that doesn't really work because they're doing theology for their own context. How would you copy right. them? Yeah. You have to do do your. You can't copy somebody else's homework. What does it mean to do your own work, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, in that sense, I, I consider this to be fundamentally just part of the tradition. Mm. No, Doctor Daniel, thank you so much. I appreciate your seriousness in terms of taking our faith and and making it real for for who we are and uh, and really, yeah, bringing our identity to to Jesus and to um to God. Thank you so much for the time and thank you for your book. I'm happy to share it. Thank you, thank you so much for having me, and and it's a pleasure to kind of be able to talk to talk to you and your audience about this. Yeah.